Intel recently announced their new Meteor Lake architecture, and as they call it, the biggest architectural shift in 40 years that came with a very new way of making CPUs. Gone are the single monolithic chips with everything from your cores, cache, IO and iGPU all on one bit of com complicated silicon. Now everything is tiles and chiplets. But why? Why have both AMD and Intel now swapped to using this modular design? Well, that's what I'm here to explain. Now, I want to start off with a bit of clarification. AMD and Intel's chiplet style designs are really quite different. The base notion that you break out subsystems like cores or IO into their own chiplets is the same, but the actual implementation is quite different. AMD mount at least two dies to the PCB layer itself. The PCB is what has the traces that connect those dies together, and the modularity comes from which I.O. die they use, such as one with or without integrated graphics, and if they use one or two core dies, meaning it's either up to an 8-core or up to a 16-core instead. This has the benefit of lower cost and complexity. The fabs already have to mount silicon dies to that PCB substrate, so there isn't all that much more difficulty in mounting multiple, especially as spaced out as they are, at least in the grand scheme of things anyway. The downside is that the dies are physically quite far apart and have to send their signals through plain old copper traces, which adds latency and is technically more vulnerable to data integrity issues. By contrast, Intel's solution looks overcomplicated and expensive. Intel is technically still mounting a monolithic chip to its PCB substrates, but that monolithic chip happens to have a set of tiles on top of the base layer. Those are the modular components. That means that unlike AMD just designing a new PCB substrate to change what connections are used, Intel has to design a different piece of silicon, have it manufactured, cut, tested, and binned, and then they can try mounting their other dies on top. This is their Foveros packaging method, and while it is considerably more expensive and complicated, it does mean things like the core tile is right next to the memory controller, meaning there should be considerably less latency when the cores need to access the memory. The fact that this is an active piece of silicon is also a pretty big deal for performance and reliable data transfer. I hope that explains the differences and similarities between the two designs. Still, the base concept is the same. Break each block into its own bit of silicon. But why though? Well, to understand that, you'll need to know how CPUs are made. As a gross oversimplification, the design of the CPU is made into a mask layer, much in the same way that you know t-shirts uh, uh, designs get printed. It's a sort of negative of what you want to cut out, or possibly the other way. Either way, the silicon is loaded in as a wafer-thin 12-inch disc called a wafer. The design then gets etched into the wafer several times, as many as they can fit on that single wafer. The larger the design, the less copies you can get out of a single you know, 12 inch disc. Uh, but the problem here is that the process of etching the design into the wafers isn't perfect and you get defects. Some of those defects end up being pretty harmless or maybe only cause a partial failure, like one core doesn't work properly but all the other cores are fine so you can just you know, sell it as a six core instead of an eight, right? but sometimes it's such a big failure, or a collection of them, that you can't do anything but throw that die out. So if you make your die as small as possible, you not only get more chips out at the end, but statistically you get better yields. You make more use of the precious silicon wafer because you don't have to throw out a big chunk of it because a couple of transistors didn't get formed properly. 
Here's an example. Intel's i9-12900K has a large monolithic die that is 20.5 millimeters by 10.5 millimeters. Plugging that into a wafer yield calculator with a somewhat optimistic defect density, you can see that Intel would get 212 dies out of a 300 millimeter wafer with 20 as partial, possibly usable dies and 44 that are fully defective dies. That is a yield of 82.65%. That's not too bad. Now let me show you what AMD gets with their core dies. They're around 10 millimeters by seven millimeters, and with the same wafer size and defect density, AMD would get 785 good dies, 60 partial dies, and 51 defect dies for a yield of 93.93%. AMD gets nearly four dies for every one that Intel produces. That is a very, very significant advantage, and one that Intel is clearly keen to exploit now too. One of the other major benefits is that if you are making your CPU out of multiple dies, the dies don't have to be made with the same process node. They don't have to have the exact same size transistors or even be built by the same company or fab. Intel's new Meteor Lake chips are made out of four different process nodes, two from Intel and two from TSMC. The core die is the only one that needs to be made with the most cutting edge power and density efficient node, which being Intel 4. The iGPU is made by TSMC using their N5 process node, uh, which is what AMD is using for their core dies, while the SoC and IO dies are made with TSMC's N6 node. And that base layer tile is made from the now ancient Intel 16 process node, because that doesn't need to be anything remotely high-tech or paradense for a sort of, you know, glorified backplane. The reason this is so important is the newest, most cutting-edge process nodes have the least capacity. Intel can only manufacture so many Intel 4 wafers at a time, so if all you need to make with that limited capacity is the tiniest little core dies, you can make twice, thrice, or quadruple the number of chips at a time. You can make, you then make all the less performance sensitive stuff on a different, older, less expensive, more mass volume process node. And hey presto, you have yourself way more chips for less money in a shorter time frame. For someone like AMD who's buying space in TSMC's production line, it's very important for them to make the most out of the limited number of wafers they can get access to. Of course, this level of modularity also has the benefit of making the chips you produce more easy to customize. AMD shows this trait off very well, especially with their uh, Ryzen 7000 X3D chips. If you buy the 7800X3D, you will get one 8-core die with their 3D V-Cache stacked on top. If you buy a 7950X3D though, you'll get that same 8-core 3D V-Cache die and a regular old 8-core Zen 4 die. AMD is literally mixing and matching the 3D V-Cache and regular dies for these chips, but they haven't had to completely redesign the chip to do that. They just dropped on a different core die. That, that is another gross simplification, of course, but I hope you get the idea. Even Intel is getting in on the modularity party, showcasing different I.O. die sizes in their presentation to better suit different packages. No doubt there will be multiple core die packages, some with maybe 2P cores and 4 or 8E cores, all the way up to the full fat 16E cores and 8P cores for the desktop chips. That's something that they previously would have had to design the entire chip around, but now they can more easily swap between them without having nearly as much work. And of course they benefit from using multiple process nodes here too, making the most use of the new Intel 4 node only for the most performance and power sensitive part of the chip. While I'm sure we could talk for hours more about this, I think that's a good place to leave it off as an introduction to chiplets and why they're now the standard. 
I find this really interesting and if you do too, I would really appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button so that we can explore more stuff like this and I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. If I got anything heinously wrong, uh, by the way, please do leave that in the comments. I would love to, to you know, know more. And of course, if you have some extra information, I would love to hear that too. Of course, if you haven't seen my video talking about the Meteor Lake launch and announcement, then do check that out. I'll leave it on the end cards for you to check out when they pop up in a second. And otherwise, that is kind of it. If you want to support these videos more than just hitting the subscribe button and watching plenty more, you can do so through YouTube, Patreon, pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one, or a load of other designs I made myself, or there's also a load of other links in the description, including to my you know, personal hardware stuff, like the open source response time tool and the open source latency testing tool. That's in the description as well. And otherwise, that's kind of it. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you all in the next video.